<laughs> we move on now to the U.S. stock index. Futures fell ahead of Friday's open. Around 5.25 a.m. Eastern Time, Dow Futures was off 145 points, indicating a drop of 129.98 points at the open. The Nasdaq and S&P 500 futures pointed to a negative open for their respective markets. The move in U.S. futures came after Wall Street finished deep in the red during the previous trading session. Earnings due for publication on Friday are JDCom, Foot Locker, and JCPenney, which are all scheduled to report before the opening bell. In data, consumer sentiment is due out at 10 a.m. Eastern Time. No speeches by the U.S. Federal Reserve are due to take place this Friday. In Asia, stocks closed low on Friday with steel producers and automakers name, automaker names recording steep drops. The fall in regional markets tracked sharp losses on Wall Street following a tariff announcement from U.S. President Donald Trump. Uh, Trump said on Thursday that the U.S. will impose tariffs of 25% for steel and 10% for aluminium. In Tokyo, the benchmark Nikkei 225 fell 542.83 points. Elsewhere, the cost fee declined 1.04%. In Australia, ASS 200 edged down 0.74%. Greater China markets followed regional markets lower, with Hong Kong's Hang Seng Index falling 1.41%. Mainland markets saw more moderate declines than their regional pairs. The Shanghai Composite closed 0.59% lower and the Shenzhen Composite slipped 0.64%. And back here, African mobile towers operator Heloids Towers plans to list on the London Stock Exchange in early April with an expected valuation of about £2 billion. Heloids is the third African mobile towers business scheduled to float in 2018 with IHS Towers and Aiton Towers also preparing for listing to fund infrastructure investment as economic growth in Africa drives increased use of smartphones and demand for data. The company, which raised $600 million through a bond issue last year, also filed for a secondary listing on the Johannesburg Stock Exchange. Heloids Towers owns about 6,600 telecoms towers in Ghana, Tanzania, Congo, Brazzaville, and the Democratic Republic of Congo. Angola mistakenly transferred a bond coupon payment to the wrong account last month and is working to correct the situation so that bondholders can receive the funds due. This is according to the Finance Ministry. And some market participants had raised concerns when a coupon payment for a 2019 dated euro bond Angola issued via special purpose vehicle Northern Lights 3 BV failed to come through to holders in mid-February. Although there is a 30-day grace period for payments on the bond and delay could disadvantage Angola as it looks to come to market to sell euro bonds this year. The bond is currently trading at 102.1 cents in the dollar, down around 0.7 cents since the start of the year. Australia's corporate watchdog has launched a court action against global miner Rio Tinto and two former executives for misleading investors about the coal reserves it reported in a $4 billion acquisition in Mozambique. The Australian Securities and Investments Commission said the company and its former chief executive Tom Albanese and former chief financial officer Guy Elliott had made deceptive statements in their 2011 annual report published in 2012. Rio Tinto had no immediate comment on SIC's action but has previously denied any wrongdoing in a similar case brought by the U.S. Securities and Exchange Commission. Rio Tinto now faces court cases in the United States and Australia over the disastrous acquisition of Riversdale in Mozambique with the U.S. SEC having charged the company Albanese and Elliott with fraud. And Zimbabwe's President Emerson Mangangwa will mark 100 days in office on March 6. Mangangwa rose to power in November last year following a de facto military coup which saw Robert Mugabe reluctantly see power. Months into his tenure, his administration is struggling to address the economic challenges facing the country. 75-year-old Mangangwa is under pressure to deliver on the economy 
and show that he's breaking away from the policies of Mugabe, whose 37 year rule since independence in 1980 turned a promising country into an economic basket case and international pariah. He has promised that the country will soon hold elections for the presidency, parliament, and local government, and has told business leaders that their investments will be secure and their profits safe. It's just a few months into his office, and ordinary citizens like Fungai Chirwa, who runs a currency changing business on the streets of Harare, say they are yet to see the country's economy improve. The new government that took over uh, from Gabi, they, they promised that they were going to create uh, jobs, but now there's nothing. And for the past three, for the past hundred days that they, they promised to give us jobs, nothing has happened. And the economy is still it's deteriorating anyway, I would say, because there's no change at the moment. So I think uh, we need new people in this new government. Under Mugabe, the economy suffered acute shortages of cash dollars, increases in price of basic goods, high unemployment and low levels of foreign investment, making it the biggest challenge for Mangagwa. We've seen a few good developments. Children below five years and adults above 60 years are now getting free medical services. We have also seen a few roads being resurfaced. The government has asked Zimbabweans to be patient and let them work in the meantime. Former Zimbabwe Finance Minister Tendai Bitti, who earned international respect during his time as a finance minister in 2009 to 2013 unity government that stabilized the country's imploding economy, says Mangagwa's government is yet to come up with policies that favor Zimbabweans. Well, of course, uh, you, you don't build Rome within 100 days, uh, but within 100 days, you should be able to set a foundation uh, for a clear strategy uh, of uh, turning around the economy, resuscitating the economy, rebuilding the economy. And regrettably, with uh, Emerson Mnangagwa, he has failed and failed absolutely uh, to set and put a fingerprint, a footprint uh, in, the, in the economy. And part of his problem was that he actually did not have a plan. He actually did not have a strategy. Nangagwa's rise to the presidency was the culmination of a power struggle between him and former First Lady Grace Mugabe, who was being groomed by her husband as his potential successor. We'll be back in a moment to stay with us.